So, good morning. Um, we can start now the last two days uh, of the school that we've devoted to the Green's function approach. Okay. And um, we already seen uh, that uh, spectroscopy can already, at least electronic insulation spectroscopy, can already be uh, tackled with uh, already one particle approach, which we like. Of course, it's very fast. And, um, and we know reliable approximation of it, even if it's uh, far from the could be uh, great even for those quantities who are uh, the observable of that theory. For example, in, uh, in the Polish uh, approach, we know that the only thing that is exact in principle is the density. And nonetheless, we use it to calculate not only total energy, but also, for example, by structures. We know that we shouldn't, but uh, since it is not that bad, we still do. And uh, for example, uh, 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 as I said, we use it uh, for, of course, total energy, but also for construction. And why not also to calculate some, some spectra? In particular, we have seen that some uh, band structure are not at all badly described by uh, EFT, even NDA, GGA. This is even simpler. This is K.O.P., but it's equivalent in NDFT, LDA, and these are only the uh, the balance band of uh, gallium arsenide. Here, the band gap would be completely wrong, but uh, you see why it is very appealing to have a one particle picture when you can compare with experiment in a, in a very innovative way. So you can explain the experiment. And we know that uh, instead, if you look at something else, for example, the band gap, we systematically uh, underestimate it. And uh, we know that there is uh, the fact that we use an approximation, but also the fact that we are interpreting something that should be interpreted as such. The homo lumo gap in Koneshan is not the photonician uh, uh, gap, even if you were exact. So we have to go uh, beyond this. The same is for the, um, for the spectra. We might imagine to have uh, our one particle approach with function and eigenvalues, for example, in Koneshan. And we can start by creating our first, uh, our first spectrum. We put it into the formula, and uh, we get the imaginary part, scopic of this uh, of this quantity here. Remember, by taking g by g prime equals zero into the space, and uh, we compare with the experiment. This is the case of the electron energy loss of graphite. Great. And on top of that, and here I remind you again: here there is no rescaling. This is exactly the number that you probably might have obtained with the P on Tuesday, or you will, <clears throat> uh, but doing this kind of calculation. And of course, it's enough to go to something else. Uh, for example, uh, Valerio already showed uh, this, uh, the optical absorption of argon. You do it in the independent particle approach, and you obtain this that has nothing to do with the experiment. And this is typically the case for uh, optical absorption. So we have seen one way, which is TDDFT. Uh, and, uh, and today we're gonna see another way with Green's function. Today we'll be devoted to the one particle Green's function. So in the first part, now here, we will uh, introduce the concept of Green's function and we'll have to define how the, what is essentially the GW approximation. And in the second part with, uh, with Matteo, we'll see actually what are all the technicalities of uh, doing a GW calculation, because it's far from the a black box. So you, you, you need to know some things. Uh, great, so we have to go uh, beyond one, uh, one particle approach. And so typically one start by this. And if I start from the definition of the Green's function, well, in 10 minutes, uh, we will arrive in uh, the definition of the GW. And for all those who already know all these things, it will be great, so we don't waste time. Uh, but now, for all those who are not already expert in that, let me take uh, a step back and start a little bit uh, uh, before that, OK? So the Green's function is a very, very general. 
we use it in many fields of uh, of mathematics, and and of course we use it in physics for some uh, for the solution of some problems. And uh, it's nothing to do with the electronic structure calculation, nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's uh, uh, even older than that, and is a generic uh, tool to solve or to approach the solution of problems typically formulated this way. We have an operator, typically a differential operator, and we want the solution of uh, this uh, uh, equation here, for example, when there is a certain external driving force. Right? I show you one example in the because it's particularly interesting for us, this, the Poisson equation. There is a differential operator acting on something that is our unknown, the potential, and there is an external contribution, which is, for example, density. So the solution here will be, what is the, pot the potential generated by a certain distribution of charges? Classic, here, yeah, there's no quantum physics here, this is a, uh, yesterday it was shown in, a, in, in another form using the uh, one of the Maxwell equation. The divergence of D is equal to four pi N. That's the Maxwell equation. If we take uh, the, 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 the potential, the, the field as the gradient of the potential, we end up with the equation. Okay, so this is very general. And uh, we would like a strategy, there are many, of course, the instruction will be one to want to have to, to, to calculate this, uh, this potential. Okay, so the first thing that we, we do is the following we define the Green's function as a solution of this equation, of a, an associated equation to this. We forget about the F, the driving force, could be anything, we forget about it, and we take this definition the Green's function is the solution. When uh, of this uh, equation, when we put here a delta. So you already see, we already put some non locality. This depends on x and y, while well, differential operator act on x. And uh, we want this, uh, this equation. And you already see, if you think in terms of uh, matrices, if this were a matrix, this were a matrix, they would be the identity. So you can already see that uh, the Green's function essentially is the inverse of the operator that you want to solve. Right? But the, symbolically, you could write that g is equal l to the power of minus one, right? Okay, so now we do a little bit of algebra. We multiply both sides times the f, which is our, our function. We integrate over. And on the right side, of course, you have, again, f of x, if you integrate over, right? Here I exchange the integral with the differential operator. Uh, it has to be a linear operator. I forgot to tell you that. So I about the linear operator. So we can exchange those things. And so you hear that we integrate over. So here we have f, which by definition was just L applied on u. So we can recognize that this is u, right? So our solution is that is given by the Green's function applied on F. So if we have a way to solve this equation, the equation for the Green's function, and to, when we know it, for the generic problem associated only to L, then we can apply to any particular F. So the solution will always be G multiplied by F integrated over. So it will be applied to any possible uh, equation of this side. You see here, we haven't solved anything so far, right? Uh, we have to either solve this equation or we have to solve this equation. So the knowledge of G is still equal to the difficulty of the knowledge of, uh, of U itself, right? There is no miracle here. But this method is indeed uh, very appealing uh, for many reasons. Uh, for example, it automatically includes the boundary condition inside. So there are several several um, helpful um, uh, points, and also the fact that it's universal. We solve this, uh, and once we know with the G, we can apply it no matter what F we put here. Okay? Please uh, stop me if you have doubts or points that you want to clarify, okay? 
And in fact, we can apply it here. You would like to apply it, for example, uh, here. If we know that the Green's function of the Laplace and V equal theta, or equal zero, who could? No, right? And, uh, and in fact, uh, ah, okay, you can do it also for uh, in time, not necessarily a differential operator in space, but it will be the same thing in time. This is uh, another example. And here is the, the Wikipedia page for Green's function. At a certain moment, this is uh, one uh, snapshot of it, one part of it, it's not the full, uh, the full page, but there is a table of Green's function because uh, it's so, so important that uh, for many differential operators, you see that there is the equivalent uh, Green's function uh, uh, associated to this uh, operator. So you see there are many operators uh, linear, uh, second order, differential uh, in space and in time, linear in time, second order in space. You have all the combination. So you're really, you're really many. Um, and uh, in particular, if we go back here, we have the Laplacian operator, three dimensional, and uh, which is just one over R. Okay? So we can apply to the first, to the first. Uh, Example. Oops. Ah, I didn't put it. Sorry, I didn't put it. So what would be if you apply it to the to the Poisson equation? Do you have any suggestion? Of course, you know by already the the answer about that, but uh, what is the if we use this uh, differential operator? For the Poisson equation, any suggestion? What will be v of r if you apply this? Go ahead. It will be this times the, the source term, so it's minus one by n. Okay, so we have to integrate these things. Here is it's uh, with respect to the origin. But this was already in R, so we cannot use the R, we have to use R minus R prime. So it would be what we see to minus one over four pi uh, R minus R prime. And then times the source. Remember, the source was uh, minus uh, four pi N bar. So the same integral of N prime, sorry, N prime, R minus R prime. Here, right. which is the, the Coulomb. Yeah, this is the Coulomb. What, what is this potential? This is, this is the actual potential. Of course, the actual potential is the solution of the Poisson equation. So it's the exact solution of a classical distribution of charge. What would be the potential of the classical charges? It would be hard. Hard is exact in the limit class. Then you start considering electrons as a, as a quantum objects, and so you have to include the exchange and correlation, of course. But otherwise, this would be the solution. And it's not the only way to solve this, but it's one way to solve the Poisson equation using the, the Green's function. Okay? <clears throat> and now we go to the quantum problem, in which we also have an operator. They add some, something, which is typically our solution. Actually, here is written slightly different, and so we, we like the previous things, so we write it like this. So that here, again, it's the, the operator acting on something, and here, the, on the other side, we have just zero, which is even better, no problem. And so these are typical energies. So to make it uh, really general, we just consider a generic quantity, Z. You will see why this is important to consider it Z, even if uh, typically the E are real quantities, but let's put it uh, in a general way. So this is, uh, again, an operator, differential operator, acting on something equal zero, and we want to, want, want to find some. Okay? And so the Green's function, is already obvious. It's the 
the opposite. Sorry, the inverse of that. This is the formal definition of G. Of course, this is an operator, right? it's not the division of an upper. This would be Z minus H to the power of minus one to be exact, but it's the formal definition of uh, the Green's function associated with the Schrodinger problem. Okay. We insert the identity operator. You know this, right? The resolution of identity, you can always uh, express the, the identity as a sum over all possible eigenstate. Base, if you have a base of, um, of your Hamiltonian, you insert all the possible states. So I0 is the ground state, first exciting state, or all the, all the possible states. If you sum them all, uh, get them bra, you will obtain one. And if I want it in, uh, in the position representation, I put an R prime in R, and I have my Green's function in real space. This would be the my Green's function in real space. Do you think we can do something else here? Because now we have uh, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. What we can do? We can have epsilon is the eigenstate of the denominator. Epsilon, uh, you mean E? Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, E. Yeah, exactly, because H can be applied directly now to the, to the eigenstate of the, to the Hamiltonian. And we'll have our uh, Green's functions here written in the position uh, representation. And uh, well, the green function is written in terms of the eigenstate and eigenvalues of the original Hamiltonian that we want to solve, of the original operator. And not uh, astonishingly, the eigenvalues appear in the denominator because it's the inverse quantities. This G is the inverse of H. So, and again, we haven't solved anything because in order to know the Green's function, we have to solve the many body problem. Not only the ground state holds stands because, and of course, maybe we don't need the Green's function if we are able to solve the Schrodinger equation for all these states, right? But formally, the G contains, and it has poles here, you see the poles, uh, in all the energies of the system. The first one will be the ground state energy, first excited state, okay? And again, this is not even necessarily uh, true for this uh, uh, quantum problem. Here I took my um, scan of my copy of the Jackson. So it's a classical electrodynamics. And in the first uh, chapters about the, the problem in electrostatics, when you have to solve a generic uh, uh, equation like this, so it's again similar to a Poisson equation. If we Go down, it works a little bit, it defines some functions that are orthogonal among each other. And at the end, we arrive with the definition of something that is called the Green's function that is expressed in terms of eigenfunction and eigenvalues of the original uh, differential operator. So it's not, uh, it's not quantum, it was known a century now. Uh, that is one way to write your uh, your problem in terms of uh, using this for your solution. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what? So we have this uh, Green's function uh, that is expressed. Sometimes this is called the Lehman representation. Okay, it was already mentioned before the Lehman representation of. Uh, of the Green's function in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, not of G, of H. Okay. okay, so now if we consider this Z being not necessarily completely real, we have a little bit of an imaginary part. This will help us in doing uh, the, the the definition of the spectral function. So the spectral function is the imaginary part of G, and you'll see that it will be essentially related to the delta in those energies. So this is why we actually want to use uh, the spectral function. We will see uh, in a moment uh, also applied to the electronic problem, but uh, because uh, as the G contains in the poles energies, 
this will be peaks in the spectral function. So if you are able to plot the spectral function, you will see peaks exactly at the energies that you want. Okay. In this case, at the energies of your uh, uh, medical. Great. However, we have to solve the, this uh, this problem here, and it's exactly what we would like to avoid. And this is the machinery that you want to explain uh, uh, today. How to avoid going through all this uh, psi zero, psi one, psi two, because we don't want to solve the many body problems. Training the question. Okay. So the question is: Is there another way that, for example, we can exploit the fact that G has all in the energy that we want? But we would like to find G in another way, of course, not by knowing the, all the possible eigenstates. So, any ideas? I mean, we have a function here. Single part. Okay, let's go in single part. In a single particle, this is always good because we know how to solve, in that case, the, the, the real problem, right? Because the Hamiltonian is factorizable, you have a, a multiplication of wave functions, <clears throat> and we have the eigenvalue. So this is a problem that we know how to solve. So what will be the Green's function in, uh, in this case? Well, before going to that, let's imagine. So we have in this independent particle picture, right? So let's imagine to do that. We create a state. We consider a state that we call a trial state. Okay, it's not uh, specifically. Of course, if uh, <clears throat> this state is one of the eigenstates, well, the system uh, will put a particle in that state. It will stay there forever because it's an eigenstate and we don't. It's useless to do any propagation. But let's suppose that we prepare a state. We don't know uh, how how it compares with respect to this. And we study its uh, temporal evolution. This is uh, quite obvious because H is um, <clears throat> time independent. So the evolution is simply the application of this over H. Okay. And now we insert again the resolution of the identity of all the possible eigenstate. And so we apply H0. We know how to apply it on phi n, right? We have just the eigenstate, the eigenvalues. And so in this case, we can define our Green's function as the, really the operator that propagates a trial state from time zero, let's say, to time uh, t. For example, this is uh, typically at the, at the origin of the definition of a propagator for the for a Green's function. And here we're not talking necessarily about electron, we're talking about generic, it's even classical. It's a generic um, uh, propagator, in this case in time. Okay? And of course, we can decide to see in position representation what these states. Uh, uh, is what is the probability that these states, for example, ends up in a state uh, with a particle in, uh, in a position R? Well, we do the same thing. And we will have the Green's function in, um, in, uh, also in the position representation. So we have inserted again the, uh, the one. And so we have a certain state that we prepare. We calculate the probability to be an electron, for example, in position R1. We propagate with this uh, operator, which is the Green's function, from R1, sorry, from R prime to R. And we have our probability to find the particle at the time t in position R. And this is defined by the, the let's say, driven by our Green's function in R, R prime, and t. Actually, here you always consider t minus zero, but uh, the position time is, uh, is dummy. But there is always a time difference, okay? In fact, it's defined like that. So our Green's function is defined always like this with the theta, so the, the t is always bigger than zero in this case. Okay, 
So we do a Fourier transform of this. We have it in time. We can do it in uh, in uh, in uh, frequency by doing this uh, Fourier transform. We will have one over omega minus g zero. And again, by inserting our identity here, we can apply h zero to psi n. We we'll obtain epsilon n, and this is our Kritz function. As we said, in the case of the, for example, conic sham, but this would be any independent mathematical approach. In the moment we have this, indeed, the Gritz function is just the sum of the eigenstates in the numerator and the eigenvalues in the denominator. Lemon representation of this H0 uh, operator. And so we see that uh, this epsilon n are the eigenvalues, so the poles of the of the independent particle Prince function. And thanks to the Gupan's theorem, we know that these are also the energy of the electrons, right? This is something that will help us in a moment. So when you say there is a probability to find a particle in our, in our prime, that means that you start from the vacuum level and you create a particle in position at prime with the uh, creation operator. And then you um, do the same thing on the other side. It's a creation operator acting on the uh, bra in, uh, in R. And so please keep in mind these two, these two um, equations. Because these are exactly the point, the starting point for our uh, uh, Green's function in the quantum real for electrons. The fact that we would like something like that, so a Green's function written in terms of something in the numerator, and it has the poles in the energy that we would like to have in the uh, denominator, and it is set, it's essentially defined by this kind of operator here, the creation and annihilation uh, operator. Okay? So for the case of independent particle, this was the, uh, the definition. Okay? And now we get back uh, yeah. <clears throat> to our point before. You see, we, we write this with a little bit of uh, element here, but maybe we can we can uh, go uh, step by step. So now we start from a system with the interacting. It's not more anymore an independent particle system. We have a full system and electrons interacting. The Hamiltonian, we know, in a kinetic energy, the Laplacian, plus the interaction term, one over R minus R prime, Okay, so uh, there, is, there are no unknowns in the Schrodinger equation, right? And the external potential will be the condition. Okay, so let's suppose that uh, now we create, we put in the system an extra electron. So we use the creation operator, we put it in R prime at a certain time, T prime, which is completely dark. Okay, but we say, this we propagate, we will see how we propagate. So we go at certain time t, and at position r, we destroy one particle. Okay? <clears throat> and we take the, the probability of this event by doing the expectation value of this uh, series of events in the ground state. Of course, we have the theta always, and we define this as the Green's function. Here it would be because we are describing, we have said that we have created the part, an electron, a position R prime in D prime. Okay, this is our uh, definition, and again, it's defined in terms of some many body quantities. These are uh, the this uh, creation operator and integration operator. We explicitly write the time evolution operator for these things, which again, since our H is time independent, is very easy. We don't have ambiguity here in defining the evolution of this operator. 
And, uh, and again here, you can do something, right? What we can do? Since there is H and there is upside zero, can we apply it? Well, we'll arrive to that. But before that, we cannot. So there is an application. Here, H can be applied to this. And this H can be applied to this. Inside here, indeed, we will need to do something. But slow, exactly. So we apply H and we have E0, which is the uh, ground state. Because this is the ground state wave function, so we'll have the energy of the ground state. And immediately you see now that uh, the whole things depend only on d minus d prime. It's obvious because time is homogeneous, it doesn't matter when you start doing this. Okay, so formally you can Fourier transform it, and you have it here. So here you have to pay attention to something <clears throat> because, so this is. In the position representation, then what is called the one particle, the Green's function for the particle, and it is really the resolvent of the H. Which uh, so the Green's function here is a R resolvent, is one resolvent of the many body um, Schrodinger equation, okay. It's not the resolver. In fact, we will see afterwards that we'll have an infinite resolvent of H. H is a many body thing, right? So, but the fact that we say we are taking the specific matrix L in the, in the ground state of one creation operator, one annihilation operator, this will be one of the possible resolvent of the Hamilton. We'll see that the two particles of this function, the three particles of this function, are written in exactly the same way. We will have more things that will be still resolvent of the full Hamiltonian. Okay? But the full Hamiltonian doesn't have one resolvent, which is uh, the Green's function of one particle. It has it also for two particles, three particles, n particles. Okay? But it's very appealing uh, considering uh, this uh, uh, like that. And now we can do the same thing for, for example, the creation of a hole. It will be the same thing. We create a hole in R and T. We propagate up to T prime and we destroy this hole R prime. And so we will have the probability of the propagation of the hole. And we follow exactly the same, same path. And we're going to have a very similar, uh, similar uh, um, result that we can typically uh, put together using this time evolution operator. You see here there is a commutator, psi, psi dagger, minus psi dagger psi. And the time evolution uh, operator uh, always put the, the bigger time on the left, smaller time on the, on the right. And so if you compare with before, this is what it does. It put t primes here on the right and t here because there is this theta function, this was uh, for the particle, and this is for the whole t smaller than uh, t prime. So it's not uh, something uh, very complicated, but uh, it's, you know, it's in order to have both the um, propagation of the whole in on the left one in one uh, definition, the Green's function, but be aware that it contains two pieces, one for the description of electron, one for the description of whole. Okay. There are many other possible ways to describe the Green's function in terms of retarded quantities, advanced quantities, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, greater and lesser retarded length instead of the occupations. So there are many, many possible ways, but one is enough already to describe everything. Okay, so again, we will write it like this, like the sum of two pieces when we bought when we go to frequency space. And uh, here, we do the suggestion of Masut. We said, maybe we can uh, put something here in this one, in this, uh, this one that appear here. We can use, again, the resolution of identity. And we have to specify what states we put here. And uh, 
we don't have a lot of choice. Actually, we don't have a choice at all because you see here, this destroy a part. So when we apply this to the ground state of n particle, we will end up to some state of a system with n minus, minus one part. So since in the Fox space, state with the different number of particles are uh, by definition orthogonal, we can only insert here states that have n minus one part. So this is the definition of identity. So these are all the possible ground state, excited state, all the possible states of a system with n minus one part. And for the same reason, on the left side, we have to insert here all the possible state of a system with n plus one part. If you want to use the resolution of identity here, because this is a state with n plus one particle, this is a state with n minus one part. And when we do this, we can again say, well, H, I can apply it here now. And H, I can apply it here. And so I will have the energies, all possible energies, not only the ground state, but all the states of a system with n minus one and then plus one part. And so I put them there and I end up with this new um, writing for the Green's function. Again, it's called the Lehman station, in which the poles of the Green's function are in the addition energy and in the removal energies of the system. You see, here in the poles, there is the difference between the state with n minus one particle minus the ground state of the system with n part. In the same here, the difference between the system with n plus one and n zero. And this, if you remember, was exactly the definition <coughs> that we wanted to describe photoemission. In photoemission, we arrive with a photon and we remove one electron. So we end up with a system, schematically, of course, with n minus one electron. So this was the operative definition of the energy of an electron, because you cannot have other than an operative definition for defined cis. It has to be a measurable procedure. And the only way to say what is the energy of the electron in the system is to remove it is to say, I measured before when the system has n electron, and I measured afterwards when the system has n minus one electron because one I managed to kick it out. It can be from any state. And this difference, this total energy difference, is the definition of the energies of the electron when it was in the system. And this is exactly what, up, what, up, what appears here. You see here, there is a system with n plus one electron in any state. It's not necessarily in the ground state, right? Could be in the ground state if I put it in the lowest possible uh, state, but I can even add an electron in a very high state. This would be an excited state of the system with n plus one, right? And I do this energy difference. This will create a pole in the Green's function. So the Green's function has poles in all possible addition energies. So if you think about it, it will be in all empty states of your system. And this uh, has a poles in any removal energies, all the possible occupied states of your system, many other states. <clears throat> um, this is uh, sometimes is uh, made more compact by calling these nasty things here F, let's call it F. And uh, by considering this uh, energy difference has uh, epsilon s that are the energies of the electrons or the energies of the holes. Uh, with this definition, can you also describe like absorption where the number of particles is the same with the Green's function? <clears throat> uh, not yet, no, because in this moment, the only thing that we did was to add one particle and destroy it. For doing that, and we'll see it, uh, in the next uh, two minutes, uh, we will have to create one particle and one hole, propagate, destroy. And in that case, we will have different denominators. Other point here, because this is essentially it in terms of the 
what is a grid's function and what it what is related to. And of course, again, here we haven't solved anything so far <laughs> because everything is defined in terms of the many body states and many body eigenvalues. And it's the formal definition of the Green's function for a system of n interacting particles. So, to answer your question, you will need other two particle operators, and so four operators, two psi, psi dark and two psi, who have information about optical excitations. And this with four operators, you will see that it is the particle green function that oh. later is going to be <laughs> This is one particle green function that not give you the propagation of an electron hole and so the excitation, the electron hole the excitations oh. like in optics. So far we can only remove or add one electron. Oh. An extra electron. It's a, it's still an indistinguishable particle from all the other electrons. In fact, I never say that here we create a particle and then we later destroy it, the same particle. We destroyed a particle. They are indistinguishable. Okay? That's what makes it complicated. Okay. And so you will always find it in an even more compact form with just one thing in which the ES are either this or this, depending then on the size of the uh, of the of this uh, quantity. So depending if the energies this of the system is uh, bigger or smaller of the Fermi energy, the chemical potential. If you are up, that means that you are adding an electron. If you are down, that means that you are removing an electron. So sometimes you find it in very compact, but uh, Remember, this essentially relates to this uh, two very uh, uh, clear uh, object. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this uh, eta that we have is a small value of imaginary form. Uh, I know that uh, we usually have it to have uh, when we have here Fourier transformation. Is there any other physical uh, meaning behind that? Yeah, so as you said, in, uh, in this uh, definition, uh, it comes, and I've been sloppy here, here there should be limit of eta going to zero plus, to be more precise. So this is, this is, a, uh, is a, a mathematical uh, trick, because to do this Fourier transform, we write this theta function here has the limit of eta going to zero of um, integral of e to the power of i, i omega t divided by omega plus i. This is a, a definition of the theta in Fourier transform uh, in the in omega frequency. And so while we put this, this trick for the eta, this permits to go to do this um, this Fourier transform very easily. Essentially, it's this step that we that we want to do the Fourier transform. Here it's not clear, it's uh, before it was clear. So here you see we have to do the Fourier transform with respect to tau t minus t prime of a function d theta of tau. So the Fourier transform of this, if you didn't have this, would be very hard and numerically unstable, and anyway, we wouldn't know easily how to do it. But with the with the theta, it's pretty obvious. You write this in frequency space, you multiply, then you do the Fourier transform of all. So you will have two frequency, omega prime and omega. But uh, you figure it out. You will take a delta of omega equals uh, omega prime plus something, and you will end up with this form very very easy. But there is still this um, definition which contains the limit of eta going to zero. So this is only math. There is no yes. physical meaning related to that. And why is the Fourier transform does not exist? <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a, a way to have a yeah. mathematical uh, yeah. trick to have the Fourier transform. So you way. see, always this Fourier transform contains this exponential, no? Yeah. And this exponential, in order to have a meaning, you always have to specify the domain, you know, when this exists. 
Um, and so it happens that you cannot uh, do it if you don't say, for example, if this t is uh, slightly smaller than zero, slightly uh, bigger than zero, and this is typically done uh, mm, with this uh, eta factor that uh, without it, without it, you will not you will not be able. <clears throat> so now that you have done this, you can give some uh, a posteriori meaning, but this will do it because afterwards we will introduce the quasi particle approximation. And in that case, uh, well, this eta is related to something very important. And so you can relate it to the lifetime of the excitation in, uh, in play here. So here you remove, uh, or you, you create a hole that will uh, essentially live only. Uh, proportional to inverse eta. This will be more or less the, the, the physical meaning. But here we haven't done any approximations. So okay, this is really the construction. And when we take the uh, imagined part, we end up with uh, something that has poles to our electron removal and addition energies, which is what we want, for example, in photoemission, <laughs> right? And in fact, in photoemission, if you do that, we will have, we will expect, let's say, we will expect something like this. We have this delta bit where there are the, uh, uh, the removal energies and additional uh, energy. Here I use different uh, uh, color because we have this, uh, this delta, here, the darkness. Delta, this will have peaks with a certain intensity, uh, where omega is equal to the, this uh, possibility to remove or add the electrons. So we will have something like this, right? Or not? Yeah, because of independence. OK, these are delta, right, for the moment. So there are peaks. These are the S of n plus one minus zero, so addition of an electron. From the other side, there is the removal electron. And we put uh, here, if it is possible, uh, the chemical potential. So for example, in, 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 in finite system, we will define this a homo, which is the highest uh, st occupied state, and this is the lumo, the lowest unoccupied uh, uh, state, OK? But then uh, this is not exactly how, if you really were able to solve the many body problem and you will have all the states, you will zoom in a little bit and you will find, for example, if you zoom in here, you will find something that is a little bit more complicated. You will have really a lot of peaks, not just, you have a lot of peaks close by. And you typically have something like, uh, like this. And the reason is because when you excite, for example, in photoemission, you don't put the system in uh, in one specific eigenstate of the of the problem. You remove uh, many many electrons. You do the, 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 the calculation. Sorry, calculation. The measurement. See, was not here. <laughs> uh, and uh, you obtain essentially a current that then you associate to the many events that uh, happened. So essentially, when you look at you will see something more similar uh, to this. And the reason is because you have then S. You have infinite S, the whole the possible excited state when you remove even one electron when you add one. So you will think they have something like, uh, like this, that if you convolute a little bit, you will obtain more or less this, uh, this picture. OK? And Let's do a summary here. This is, for example, what we obtain in uh, for the for the emission spectrum of bulk C. Okay, so here you see that uh, it's very similar to what I showed before. We have to look at this part. It's for the emission, so you only can remove electrons. Okay, it's not inverse emission. So this part we will not see. We go and see what they have done at. Uh, Solar synchrotron, tempo beam line. This is the spectrum, the 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 spectrum, the photoemission spectrum of silicon. And now 
you compare it with your, for example, with your band structure. You put the band structure of silicon, this is again taken from Wikipedia. And you see that if you align the energies, more or less, you will see that you have the bands here, these are the bands, and then you have still something else. You see? And in your bands, don't have anything. Don't have anything. These are your uh, SB uh, bands of silicon. And the next uh, uh, band going down, there will be the 2S and 2P, which are uh, if it's 20, 30, or it will be a one up. They will be here, the other parts. But in the in the photo emission spectrum, you see things. You see something. Okay? And in fact, the reason is because you, 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 you have all this... Uh, you have all these uh, extra states that you get because we are... Sorry, I went in the other direction. Okay. You have this uh, strange situation that if we were able to solve the many body problem, we will obtain all these determinants. These are typically called the quasi particle when there is uh, an obvious uh, main peak uh, in your uh, picture, and there are other little peaks. Uh, these are called typically satellite. This is the nomenclature that we use that are associated with this uh, uh, spectroscopy. And uh, and so, to summarize, you have the one particle picture, the one that we did at the beginning, in which you have energies, finite and uh, uh, discrete values of this, uh, this energy that are related to uh, some potential in your, in your Newtonian. You have also one particle wave function. So the, the, the spectral function contains only deltas, and you will have this kind of things. Then you have the many body picture, in which, again, you have a lot of delta peaks. And lots of them. And uh, you don't have one particle wave function, you have the wave function of everything. And uh, well, no problem for the potential here. And then you have an intermediate picture that we would like to keep, which is this quasi particle picture. So ideally, we would like something that in once we give you for one, um, for one excitation, the entire green curve in once, so in which the spectral function will not just be a delta, it will be something more uh, as a function of frequency, uh, in which we can already imagine that the potential entering must be frequency dependent. Otherwise, you will not obtain uh, uh, the solution, which is uh, frequency dependent. So this is what we are after. This is what we want to start from. And we want to completely remove the many body picture now. We don't want to solve the Green's function, sorry, the, the, the Schrodinger equation. Okay? And so we start again from the definition. We have all this, uh, we have all these poles. Actually, the Green's function is used for, for many other things we don't discuss here, but uh, uh, the Green's function contains the density, it's diagonal, the density matrix can be used to obtain any observable of one body operator, can be used to obtain the total energies. We won't use here this for other observables. We want just this spectral function, okay? But this is possible. Okay, so we want to obtain that. And again, we start from an independent particle system, which we know what will be. No problem for that, we already seen that. And we want to go beyond. And the only possibility to go beyond that is to verify if we can do something. And uh, there are not many things that we can do. Ah. Yeah. Okay, so we have this definition and we, well, it's defined in terms of this uh, many body state. So if you want to verify if there is another, another definition for G. Okay. So what is typically done is say, okay, let's write the equation of motion. We derive G with respect to time and see what happens. And actually what happens is not great because here you see the only part that depends on time is this uh, evolution of variable here that appears here. And, and, and 
And simply, this uh, time evolution operator, which intrinsically is of dependent time, but we can do this, uh, these things. And so, if we do it, there is one good point and many bad points. So, the one good point is that uh, if you start doing the derivative, I don't put here all the details, it's a bit tedious. I have the lecture notes if you want. Okay. But what is good is that uh, when we do this, we can define the g in terms of g0, where is g0 is the Green's function of a one, the one particle approach. That means that is uh, the Green's function of the in of the system without interaction. So it's just a Laplacian with the term and the external uh, operator, no interaction. So we would know again how to find it. And then we go over and we obtain these nasty things, which contains again G0, the Coulomb term, no, and this other object here, that you see the, the suffix of two, that is a, a two particles in function. So at the end, you end up, since you do this time derivative of the time evolution operator, what you end up, if you remember when you do the, the derivative of an operator, you write it as operators commuting with H. And when you start doing that, you will obtain something that is a two operator. And so doing the derivative, the time derivative of the two operators that are contained here, you will obtain four operators, and they are here. I spare you the details, but this is what you obtain. You obtain a quantity that is can be defined as the two particles of this function. See here, in this case, we uh, create two particles and we destroy two particles. We can do a, a parenthesis here about the two particles in function because it will be useful also for uh, for tomorrow's uh, uh, lecture. So she, she doesn't have to cover everything. But uh, it's also partially answered to your uh, point. Here you see, I define one specific uh, two particle field function. Here I call the particle particle. So, what I do is I create a time t prime, one particle in F4, and at the same time, a particle in R. This is my choice, okay? Uh, I could have taken uh, in t prime and in t double prime. I can create two particles, one after the other. But in this case, I create a specific, I choose a specific field uh, function that creates two particles. In two different points of space at the same time, I propagate them, and both of them I sorry, and I destroy two particles at the same time t greater than right in position r one, and again I get the probability of this event. So this is the probability of having two particles added in three in these two points, and the with the probability of removing them in these two points. And again. Can do all the machinery, you express uh, the time evolution of data, uh, you apply h to psi zero, and then you do the Fourier transform. And here you see you obtain another resolver of the same many body operator, but now you have two operators. And in this case, you really create two electrons, remove two electrons. And so, for example, this will be the particle particle. If you create and destroy, and then destroy and create, you will have the particle hole. And here you see this destroy the particle. This creates a particle. So once apply this two operator, you will end up with a state with the n particles, still n. So if you want to now do this resolution of identity here, you would put all possible state of a system with n particles. So then you apply H, and here you will obtain E S exact state minus E zero. And so here you will obtain the chi uh, value you expressed yesterday, which is the density density response function. You will obtain the poles of this two particle of this function will be in the difference between a system in an exact state with the system in the ground state. No difference in part. So it's uh, the neutral excitation of your system. But only if you consider this uh, particular uh, um, 
two particle beam function, which is the particle. This is the particle. Particle, you could define the whole world. Okay. So you have these two particle greens function that of course doesn't help because now we have two unknown. So, and uh, now you do another trick that I will not explain in details at all, which is this, uh, the two particle greens function, I express it as the product of two greens function, which would be the most of the things I consider that the propagation of two particles, first of all, is the propagation of one particle and the propagation of the other particle, but this is not the full story plus something else, and this plus something else can be demonstrated is just the linear response uh, variation of the Green's function with respect to an external potential. Vanishing external potential. So it doesn't matter what we put here, okay? We just put something and then we put it to zero at the end of the, at the, end of the job. But it creates this one, two, three, four quantity here. So the G2 is four point, because it describes the propagation of two parts. So if we remove this, of course, we will have just a, a, the independent propagation of two particles. So we can put this uh, back to the previous formula. And if we do that, we obtain an equation, sorry for all the indices, but it can get worse, in which the Green's function is expressed with the only one particle Green's function, even if it contains this four point, uh, which is four point, okay? But, uh, the ingredients, let's say, are the function, the Coulomb interaction, and the G of the independent particle, or sorry, of the non-interacting system. Okay, and this is a very difficult equation to solve, okay? So we don't typically solve, even if most recently, we have done some, uh, some uh, effort uh, doing ansatz for this. You can imagine this is the first order in, uh, in G, Differential uh, in G, so you can do answers like uh, I imagine the G is in the form of an exponential and try to, uh, to, get, uh, to get something out of it, but it's very, very complicated. So, what typically the people do is uh, well, look at this G is equal to G0 plus G0 something G. Right? Does it Tell you something, this kind of form. Doesn't tell you. That's what I mean, exactly. So let's imagine for a moment that we don't have this horrible term here, which contains this four uh, four cell. Well, we just uh, put it to zero. We will have a Dyson equation for G. We don't know ingredients. And actually, here, what is G of uh, two same indices? The density. The density. So I have the density times the Coulomb integrated over, what is it? The density times the Coulomb? Oh. The hatch. So if I remove this, all of this, I will obtain the hatch to green hatch. So I start from an independent particle one. I add the Coulomb in this, uh, sorry, I add the, the, the hatch to potential here. I do the greens, the, the, the Tyson equation. G, and now we we'll end up with the G that is equivalent to do a hard calculation. So the lemma representation of the G's, of this G, if I write in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, what would be the hard to wave function and the hard eigenvalues? So this is one approximation. Of course, very rough approximation. We are talking for an hour to obtain the hard to function. Okay. But it's one approximation. And uh, if we want to go beyond the hat, we have to consider this step. Yeah. Uh, now here we do a little trick. We express instead of delta g over dx, we write this in terms of delta of inverse g. This can be done. It creates two g's here. And I do that because otherwise I will not have a Dyson equation. You see, here I don't have the g appearing explicitly, so I don't have the Dyson equation. G is equal to G0 plus G0 something G. And I do that. But I can make it over by doing, instead of this, express it in terms of DG to the power of 1. It will make 2G appears here. We can do this. It's very easy. And now I have a Dyson equation. Okay? I have 
G is equal to G0 plus G0 something, the something is the R3 plus all these G. Thanks very much. And again, difficult. There is always this uh, dumb term at four point. And again, let's forget about it for you. I cannot put it to zero. Okay, because otherwise you would put everything. <laughs> well, I put it to one. I imagine that this is a delta in uh, delta in five, four, and six. Four. I put it to one. What will happen? A trifoc. Because again, here I have the G times three, four, and you see they have the same indices, but the Coulomb potential is instantaneous in time. So this G has also is multiplied by a delta in time. So this is all, only a density matrix. So density mass of that GC, it will be the Fock term. So this is the hartree fock Prince function. And when we consider everything in that term, so this is not one, DC, G, and everything, well, we give it a name. We give it the name of self-energy. It has, after all, the dimension of a potential. In fact, it has, has a, it's a sum to the part of uh, what is uh, the R3. So we, we call it self-energy. And this is the correct equation. And again, when we put this to one, we will obtain a four. If we put all this to zero, we will obtain a part. There are two possible uh, Approximation for the full green uh, Dyson equation for the green function in terms of the self energy. So, this is our G. Sometimes it's easy to consider our starting point G R3. In that case, we will have a new uh, Dyson equation. But, uh, I mean, this is just a uh, moving the the, uh, the 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 potential from one way to another and uh, and here you see i don't know anything about sigma so far but already i can uh, i can do this i can take the imaginary part of the green function so if this is not here we know that this is the g0 hatrick so it's the one particle approach my lemma representation will give me just a Delta P. Okay? And now, if I put the sigma that has a lot of indices, so it depends on space and time, so it's sigma 1, 2, so that means sigma R1, R2, T1 minus T2, so it's frequency. If I put uh, the spectrum function, something from this, I will obtain. This value for the imaginary part of the Higgs function. So I will have here in the denominator the real and imaginary part of sigma. And in the numerator, I will have the imaginary part of sigma. And if you uh, try to figure out what this shape could be, well, it is exactly this, this kind of shape. And in fact, you, I can also put uh, one shape. So I have here one shape for the imaginary part of sigma, and you see that if the imaginary part of sigma is a, a Lorentzian in a certain point, the real part by Kramers chronic would be related to this uh, thing, so we do something like this, uh, like we seen for the real and imaginary part of epsilon, the same thing. And so the, the, this green will be this part. And you see that when the green part is zero, and the imaginary part is small, this denominator will become very, very small. So you will have a peak. And this is where it happens. And this gives the quasi particle. But also, when this thing is not too big and the imaginary part of sigma is big, which is in this region, I will have a peak in the spectral function. And this is the satellite. So already by considering the possibility to have a frequency dependent sigma, your imaginary part of G, so your spectral function will have a quasi particle peak and a satellite. And this is what we are after. We just have to find now an approximation for sigma, 
which is frequency dependent. If we put uh, again for sigma only uh, sigma x static, we will obtain just the peak in a different position, but we will not obtain this uh, this shape. And also in the case of Arctic Fox, we will not have it like that. So we'll be again just a delta. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, considering the fact that uh, this uh, image of sigma uh, is related to time life, and uh, this uh, point you said that once this uh, the imaginary part is large, uh, we the satellite effects. Is it true to say that the uh, satellite effects have larger lifetime than the quasi particle peak? Um, well, generically, it is the case. Now I will have to verify if this uh, mathematically holds uh, correctly because, uh, so in the quasi particle picture, the only, uh, the only uh, part that depends on the lifetime is this part. So it's this, you don't evaluate here because this has nothing to do with the inverse actually imaginary part of sigma. Imaginary part of sigma tells you this width. So now in reality, in reality, um, this typically is related to possibility of extracting an energy at that energy, and so extracting an electron at that energy, so that means that you will be related. What is the lifetime of this hole? So if I extract an electron, how much the system will take? How, 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 how much time the system will take to fill it up? This would be a real uh, um, uh, the, the lifetime of this excitation related to this part. And of course, here well, it depends on the on the on the um, uh, physics origin of the satellites. For example, if this satellite is a plasma, because when you remove an electron, you can imagine that all the other electrons will start, oh, there is a hole, let's screen it. So they will move to screen that in a collective excitation, and this would be, for example, a plasma. So we know that the plasma has a different lifetime than the excitation. So the oscillation related to this uh, plasma will be different, so will be a different energy, but also the lifetime of this, so how much this oscillation will, uh, will endure is completely different from the lifetime of the body. So physically, we will not have the same lifetime of the two kinds of excitation. But uh, the, in, in, in this formula, if you look at this formula, the lifetime of this related to the imaginary part of sigma, only related to this quantity here. There is nothing here that tells us uh, that it, we just now we are imagining. But for example, this, um, these uh, uh, satellites, for example, in nickel, are related to completely different mechanisms. They're not plasma. They are typically whole, um, whole, whole interactions, so electron whole, whole interactions. So they are uh, three particles uh, um, quantities that have even different lifetime. And so in that case, I wouldn't know, for example, if it is bigger or, light or, or smaller than the lifetime related to the removal of electrons. I wouldn't know. I would have to check. I don't really remember. So then we will have really to see what is the origin of this uh, satellite. Okay? But in order to have it for sure, we need the sigma, which is frequency dependent. Otherwise, we will have a delta peak. And so, <clears throat> even if there is a, a nice mathematical derivation, here I will say, okay, I have my sigma, which is a potential. It acts like a potential, even if it is uh, depending on two space coordinates. The sigma of one, two has r one, r two, and time one, time two. In frequency uh, space would be r, r prime, and omega. So I consider uh, an equation in which this sigma can appear, and I call it quasi particle equation. Actually, there is a mathematical reason why to do that. But here you can imagine that by, by uh, in comparison with uh, R3 and, and R3 fog, you can imagine an equation that is really looks uh, simply like, uh, like that, in which you have a new potential beyond the beyond R. And in fact, if you consider here only the, uh, 
the GV and not uh, the rest of this delta G minus one uh, over delta Vx, if you consider P1, uh, you will have here a uh, uh, upper block again, because this will rest with that. This frequency dependent will disappear, and this will be non local. In this case, will be that the FOC. The FOC but we have this uh, massive particle equation that is essentially where I try to want to do act. But we need an approximation for sigma. Okay, as I said, you can have a free fork, which is again an approximation of the quasi particle equation. Okay, so here we have one equation, two unknowns, G and sigma. This is our sigma. By the way, have you ever thought this equation? You see, G, V, have you ever heard of gamma? So this would be G, V, let's call it gamma. Okay. Actually, if you put this gamma to one, you have again a trivoc. Now we do a little bit of uh, something because uh, when we do this approximation, you put this to one, we obtain a trivoc. And we know that artifoc is not that great. I mean, if you are calculating total energies of atom, it's very good, but overall, artifoc is not that great, especially for solids, right? We want something better. So, we change this uh, variation going through the total potential in such a way that now we have the, 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 the variation of G minus one is very low, and we thought we can do this. And this is the definition of the inverse directed function. This is epsilon minus one. And you remember, epsilon minus one times V is the screened Coulomb interaction. Okay? So instead of GV gamma, we will have a GW gamma, where this is our screen interaction. And here, when we put gamma to one, we will see also another definition, but we will have GW for sigma, which is our approximation. And by doing this uh, is a very good way, because uh, you see here, we make an approximation at this level, sorry, at this level, and we have our three four. Artifact is not good because essentially what it leaves out when you do this approximation, it leaves out a bare curve, too strong. When we do the same approximation here, I put in this uh, derivative to one, we have GW, which is a much better approximation because W is screen, is less strong than, uh, than V, and uh, you will see some, uh, some result, but you, you, you know already that GW is better than than Artifoc or Arti or independent uh, or uh, LDA. And another way to see this, beside putting again this to one because it's three point, it's better to avoid it. We can also see it in a different way by uh, calculating even more form. And again, I will not bother you with the details, but uh, starting from these two, you can go on and define other values. You can see what is gamma after all, by doing the fucking derivative, in which uh, um, sigma appears again. This is nice. Now we have three equations, three, uh, three unknown. Well, sorry, four unknown. There is also gamma. We don't know that. Yet. And w is epsilon minus one v, or we can make it in terms of another quantity, this is p, and p is itself related to g. So, I don't expect you to follow all this, simply that it is possible to define more quantities that are related to each other in such a way that at the end, you end up with five equations with five unknowns, which are the heading equation. And heading is this guy. That I was lucky enough managed to, to, to know him. He also lives, right? Yeah, yeah, very nice, very nice guy. He died when we were in a conference. Right? Remember, we were in a, in a conference uh, with uh, with his uh, with his uh, pupils also. Okay, so here we have this five equation with five log, and the typical way to see this possibility. Well, we don't know where to start. We start with G because in G we know at least one approximation for G. For example, G zero. And we start, for example, G Hartley or G Z or G Hartley Fock, G Koneshamme, Lievich, with one particle. And then with G, you put gamma to one because you don't have sigma. So you don't have the, the gamma is one. 
Then uh, D would be G, G gamma, but gamma is fine, so it would be just G, G. Sometimes you call this RPA, equation of two bits function. Then from uh, the P, we end up to W, which is W, RPA. And uh, with G and W, we do sigma, still gamma is one, and we have our uh, approximation, which is typically called G0, W0, or uh, GW one shot. There are many names in this, uh, this, uh, this uh, things, but uh, this is essentially what it happens. And, uh, and of course, you could continue and you can calculate again the new G with this, uh, 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 this sigma. And so you will have now the eigenvalues in, the, in different positions. If you take the imaginary part, you will have a quasi particle uh, uh, picture with a quasi particle and such. Not necessarily good enough for this approximation, but you will have. And so you can see it as a dynamically screened artifoc because uh, artifoc is G, B, and now we have epsilon in the middle, so you screened the Coulomb interaction, so it's a screened artifoc, dynamical because epsilon minus one depends on the things. You can also have static, you will have statically screened artifoc, sometimes it's called cosex. Well, you have several. And uh, you can put it in your uh, quasi particle approximation for GW. This is not that easy to solve. You will see it uh, with, uh, with Matteo that you have some, some caveats because it's not an eigenvalues problem. You see, because uh, the energy that you want to obtain as an eigenvalue and also here, so it's not an eigenvalue problem, but there are ways to solve it, typically in perturbation. Okay, so these were the results that I showed you before. GFD LDA. I put artifact because I stole it from uh, Valerio's slide. The time too big because the D is too strong, the D on screen is too strong. And if I do GW, you already seen this, uh, you obtain better value because, after all, the GW is a much better approximation than considering an independent part of the uh, picture. Actually, this is a GW one shot, this G not W not. There are other uh, things that are uh, that are done in this, uh, this article, like the quasi particles and consistent GW, that are extra way. It's not perfect, huh? and, you, and you find also uh, things that are even worse than this, uh, these things. Here it will be perfect if you were on top of this uh, uh, dotted gray line, which is the experimental band gap to the calculated one, but uh, you are not on top, then you are in the worst case. And, uh, and if you go to, to the spectral function, it's not great at, at all uh, here for silicon. It gives you a satellite. So you see, you obtain a satellite. You obtain even two satellites, sort of. But it's not, uh, it's not satisfactory. And for this, you have to go really uh, beyond the simple GW. And there are ways, actually, to do it. I'll show you one case, which is done with a cumulant approach. Indeed, by solving the original uh, equation with G, no sigma was the differential equation with some answers, you can obtain this. But the point was that you can obtain now better one particle by electron and efficient uh, energies. And so you can compare with photo emission spectroscopy uh, with digital W. And, uh, in order for you to do it, you will have to now to verify all the technical details because it's not as a very one box where we saw a black box calculation. There are a lot of little details to solve the quasi particle equation. And you will see this after, after the coffee break. And here I put some, some uh, um, literature, either the original headings paper where there is essentially everything that I said is there already in this old paper. But in this book is done with the, all the derivation and uh, with the much, let's say, more modern <laughs> um, uh, way of writing things. And uh, well, questions then. 